Roll Tide and welcome to the Advantage Center here at Bryant-Denny Stadium. This is Roger Hoover. Now please be joined by Alabama offensive lineman Tyler Booker for Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR. And Tyler, Roll Tide, spring football in the books. How you feeling? I'm feeling great. How are you? I'm doing really well. Uh, it was fun to be back at Bryant-Denny Stadium for the Golden Flake A-Day game. Just uh, what did you like about your performance that day as spring practice came to a close? Um uh with my performance, I was just glad I was able to tie up some of the things that were lingering from the season, just making sure I'm really honing in and focusing on my technique. So I, I see a progression of my game. So my freshman year, I was just trying to figure things out. My sophomore year, I was trying to dominate. Now going into the junior year, I'm trying to dominate with technique and just really be the best version of myself. So. I can help lead this team to a national championship. That's certainly the goal for the Crimson Tide. Uh, where were you working on the offensive line throughout spring? I worked at left guard, and I went out to left tackle every now and then just to say that I, I've done it just because the, the best ability is availability. So you never know what happens in the game of football. If I need to go out there and play left tackle, now we can say that I have the reps banked in. Um, if we get in the pickle, I'll be ready. There you go. What are the biggest differences between left guard and left tackle? Uh, left guard, you have – you have support from both sides of you. So you're secure. You don't feel that much space. You're not in that much open space. But when you're at left tackle, you're pretty much on an island. So you have this – your whole left side is free, and then you're you're taught not to, but sometimes you drift out. So that inside is left open as well. So you just have to be very cognizant of where you are in comparison to your teammates and just making sure that you have really great technique because the guys that we're facing, they're essentially wide receivers. There are guys that couldn't catch the ball, wide receivers that couldn't catch the ball because the guys are getting smaller and faster as the years go by. So just making sure that our technique is on point, making sure we get to the spot. But um, tackle is pretty challenging, but it's a challenge that I'll be willing to take on if need be. That's certainly good to see. Do you love having that kind of versatility? I mean, that's what college is for, right? Getting to know all of these different spots because who knows where you could be asked to play one day down the road, not only for Alabama, but maybe in the NFL. No, exactly. And in the NFL, they only travel with seven offensive linemen. So if you can only play one position, you better be pretty darn good at that one position. But <laughs> if you're not, you better be able to play multiple positions. Like there's a lot of guys in the NFL who can play all five positions, left guard, right guard, left tackle, right tackle, and center. So snapping the ball, that's something I've also been working on throughout the spring just to add more value for myself. Okay, take us through the mentality of trying to snap the ball and play the center position because there's so much going on, and in so many ways you are the leader of the entire offense when you have the ball in your hand. Definitely. It's um, it's tougher than people think, you know, because like you said, you have to make sure that the entire offense is on point. Like I have to make the, the center has to make the mic calls. You have to make the right point. I have to make sure that – people on, on both sides of me know what they're doing because if I'm at center, I make this the point, somebody says something wrong and somebody else is over here says something right, I have to make sure everything is okay. All that before I even snap the ball and do what I have to do during the play. So it's pretty challenging, but that's a, um, the challenge, I had, challenge I've had fun learning. How do you get a rhythm with a quarterback getting to learn their cadence and make sure you guys are on the same page? Um, with this offense, there's not a lot of rhythm with the cadence just because we don't want defenses to be able to tee off because um, – we're, it's obvious now we're on a clap. People have seen the spring game. So as the quarterback does this, they could time it up as soon as his hands are out there. So we're really taught not to time it up or have, have a rhythm with the cadence just so the defense can't tee off on us. That's certainly good to see for the Crimson Tide. So, again, that's spring practice. That's certainly in the books now. Uh, what's coming up for you uh, this summer to get ready for the fall? This summer to get ready for the fall, I'm really going to focus on tightening up my body, losing a little bit of weight, coming in the fall camp a lot leaner just so I can – um, be the best version of myself for the team and then also the next level. There, there's not a lot of 350-pound offensive of linemen, so just cutting down, looking, for, looking for, forward to the future, but at the same time doing what I need to be, do in order to have that future that I want. Of course, fans can kind of look at some of the footage that's put out by Alabama football social media accounts, see all the work you guys are doing in the weight room. How about all the work you're doing when you're eating your meals and getting the right nutrition? How much do nutrition and then all the work you do in the weight room go hand in hand? Nutrition and the weight room work hand in hand. Like like you just said, like if I'm working all these hours in the, nu in the, in the weight room and then I go eat somewhere that I'm not supposed to <laughs> for all three meals of the day, it pretty much cancels each other out. So like I... If anything, it puts me at a deficit of work. So um, you just have to be very cognizant of what you're putting into your body because you, your, your body is your business and you don't want to put bad parts in it. 
You know. but is that part of the learning curve once you got to college? Because I imagine you heard some of that stuff in high school and IG Academy, but I imagine it was a little bit different trying to make sure you had all the nutritional goals and the kind of the way to log everything once you got here. Um, the, I think the only thing that was different once I got here was, was probably just like the app that we were using to eat to log our meals. But at IMG, my nutritionist, Sean Pitcher, shout out to Sean, he gave me a great foundation and a great base of um, nutrition, like what to eat, when to eat it. Um, and then also like having balance because if you just eat, eat amazing all the time you're going to reach that point to where you just pick out on something so just having those scheduled meals when you can cut loose a little bit but just knowing that you're gonna have to make up for it throughout the week as well there you go so again that's all part of what you're doing right now for the crimson tide i do want to go back and take a look at your football journey and how you got here to tuscaloosa uh first of all where are you from i was born and raised in new haven connecticut yes sir very good i've been there before i had a summer school i went to years ago at yale uh, what'd you like growing up in that town uh, I really just like the community and being an athlete from there. We don't have a lot of athletes that come out of New Haven. So uh, people were, would just naturally gravitate towards me because of how far they see, how far they um, have seen me gone thus far. And they've been behind me the whole way. And I'm looking forward to go back, going back to New Haven. Um, May 18th, I'm holding a, my third youth camp there. So looking forward to getting back and giving back to the community that has given so much to me. Do you feel like New Haven's more of the New York metro area or truly part of New England? Probably the New York metro area. That's that's the same type of culture and vibe that we have. I have a question for you, actually. Yes. So when you were at summer school in New Haven, did you get any of the pizza? I got a lot of the pizza. I can't really remember <laughs> many of the spots right now. I kind of hit up that main strip that Yale has. We kind of went there. I and mean, we were high school kids yeah. at the time. So we went uh, up and down that main strip. But I love It's that really good thin pizza, right? Yep, the thin crust. <laughs> Chuck's has the best pizza in town. Some of the best pizza in town. Um, the standard does a good job. But Chuck's does it really well just because they have a brick oven. There you go. And yeah. that's where like the Frisbee was invaded because of the pizza pans, right? I heard that was really? one of the stories they told us at Yale was that, you know, all these like excess pizza pans, people start throwing them around and they started playing, you know, Frisbee out, outside of that maybe. Oh, wow. Well, that's that's a story for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's news to me. That's certainly good. With that, did you grow up a New York sports fan? Um, no, actually, I grew up a Pittsburgh Steelers fan because my uncle was on the practice squad for them right around when I was born. So we just carried over that momentum. There you go. What's his name? Eulish Booker. Very good. Yeah. Where he play in college? He um, went to Michigan State, and he was actually recruited by Coach Saban as well. And he played under Coach Saban for a year, and then that next year, I believe Coach Saban went to LSU. I have an idea Coach Saban remembered that then when he started talking to you. Is that right? He did. We had to, <laughs> we had to jog his memory a lot, but it, um, just having that relationship and having that respect for Coach Saban growing up and just always knowing what kind of caliber of coach he was, that was always ingrained into me. So choosing him as my coach for college was a no-brainer pretty much. That's really good. Uh, for you, you had the unique opportunity to go to the IMG Academy. A lot of athletes will just stay in their hometown, stay in their uh, different high schools. So why was it important for you to take your game to the next level and leave town and go down to Florida to the IMG Academy? It was important for me to go to IMG Academy just because I want to be the best of the best. And um, Connecticut football isn't where it needs to be to be considered an elite level. And then I didn't even spend my freshman year of high school in Connecticut. I actually went to Bergen Catholic in New Jersey. New Jersey has elite football but it's not on the biggest stage. IMG was on the biggest stage every single week. I was, I think I played on ESPN probably five or six times in high school, um, just having all of the um, the media attention. And that, that's not the only reason why I went, but just having that kind of pressure on me, it just forced me to perform better. And then just being around so many elite individuals, regardless of sports. So there's really no room for you to have that big head as the hometown hero and be like, oh yeah, I have all these offers. Well, the kid next to you is going to be a millionaire in about two years because he plays basketball. He can um, be one and done. So just being around all those elite individuals, you are um, it was the best kind of peer pressure you can have. <laughs> <laughs> you already mentioned like the nutrition was kind of set up at a college level already. Just how many other things were really set up with college like at focus and uh, in intensity? Pretty much everything. So another funny story, the weight room, a lot of the technology that we have in the weight room here at Alabama, we ha I already had an IMG. I've been using it for three years three and a half years already before I even got here. That's because Coach Ballou was at IMG for about two or three years, and he implemented that whole system and technology. So I have, I've been on the same weight program for about six years now. And um, just having that advantage of knowing how to train like a pro, how to eat like a pro, how to work like a pro at such a young age, once I got here, it was pretty much a seamless transition. Who are some of your teammates uh, from football that are doing really well in college or maybe even now on the NFL? Uh, some of my teammates that are doing really well, well, JC and I, we were on the same offensive line. 
he's performing really well. So my junior year, I think that was the best team that we had when I was at IMG. JJ was the quarterback. JJ McCarthy was a quarterback. JC Latham was the left tackle. I was the right tackle. Uh, the left guard was Najee Harris. He's a um, he's a starter for Florida right now. The right guard was Ethan Lane, and he um, switched in with Lou Bob. Both of those guys are at Division One schools. Ja'Cory Brooks was one of the wide receivers on that team. Uh, the defensive side of the ball was pretty good too. Xavier Sori, he he's at Georgia. Um, he was out, he was on that team, and then my senior year, Jaha Campbell was on that team. Keon Sab was on that team. So just being around a lot of <laughs> a lot of dudes, he had a lot of dudes on that team. So uh, just being around greatness, it it just made you want to be great. How about from any other sports that our fans would recognize? Oh, we had I was in class with Jarris, um yeah, Jarris Walker. He's he plays for the. Pacers now, I believe. Um, Jet Howard, the son of Jawan Howard, he plays for the Magic. Um, I remember having lunch with Arma- Armando Beckett a few times. So just, just guys like that, high high level athletes like that. Well, you certainly got to perform at a high level. Uh, when did Alabama start uh, to notice you in the recruiting process? A little late, actually. <laughs> and I had kind of real Alabama off. I was like, nah, they don't want me. I'm not going to go there. Like, why would I go there? They're, they're on to me so late. I think it was right right when I was setting up my official visits. So I had um, I had in mind I was going to go to a certain school. I want to name names. But I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to schedule it here. My my dad was like, no, like, what are you going to do if Alabama calls? I was like, man, I'm not worried about Alabama. Like, <laughs> Alabama's not worried about me. And as, as I'm texting one of the coaches of said school, I get a text from Coach Gillespie. He was like, call me. I want to set up this official visit. So I was like, all right, I guess. So I made that the last weekend. Um, I made that my last official visit because I did all my official visits in one month. And um, just being able to compare Alabama to everybody else and see why we are the premier college football program in the nation just – um, I think that was the best way to go about it, being able to see Alabama, seeing the peak, and then seeing everything else beforehand. Like That made my decision a whole lot easier. What stood out to you when you first got on campus? Was it the stadium, the Mount Moore Athletic Facility? I mean, what really impressed you the most? Uh, what impressed me the most was actually J.C., just seeing how much he, he – so he was my host. J.C. had matured so much from when, from – IMG to how he was at Alabama and then just interacting with him, see how much he's grown, he had grown and then going through the, like you said, nutrition, going through the academics, the, the training room, the weight room, everybody was committed to excellence. Excellence was a word that I heard a lot. And then the thing that pretty much made me commit when I knew I was going to Alabama, uh, my mom, she, I love her to death, but she doesn't know much about football. <laughs> when I <laughs> when I got offered by the University of Georgia, she was like, what's Georgia? I was like, mom, I'll, I'll call you back. I'll call you back. <laughs> she was killing the mood a little bit. But um, she said this to me. She said, IMG, you're at the pinnacle of football right now, IMG. Why would you go anywhere else? You have to go to the pinnacle of football at the college level as well. So hearing that from her and she doesn't know much about football, that was just, um, in my opinion, a sign from God telling me that this was the place for me to be. So J.C. Latham got to host you. Robert Gillespie, you had a lot of contacts with him. How about your first contact with Coach Saban? My first co- contact with Coach Saban was great. He just told me the opportunity that I had here. He he didn't make any promises like, oh, you're going to play here. He said, if you come in here and you work, you're you're going to get everything that you want out of this place. And that's all I, all I needed. All I needed was the opportunity, knowing that if I do what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to see the field. And that's what happened my freshman year. Did you get to sit in his office and have that conversation? I did. Yes. So you're sitting at that table with what all the championship rings <laughs> on the coffee table facing you, right? And, yeah. and you have to look through those rings basically to look to him. Yeah, it was great marketing on their part. <laughs> 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 exactly. I mean, that had to be cool. I mean, just again, to pick his brain for a little bit uh, and then you get to not only uh, make the decision to come to play for Alabama. So again, everybody's nice really trying to work hard to get you here to Alabama. And I imagine you wanted to be coached hard, but was that your experience as a freshman? No. How did it go? Well, once you make that transition from getting to know these guys and recruiting to now they are coaching you, they're trying to get you ready to play your best for the time. So when I got here, my the offensive line coach that recruited me, he actually took a job elsewhere. So Coach Wolf, um, he and I had a relationship through recruiting, but I, um, he was somewhere where I didn't, I know I didn't want to go. So when he got here, I was very excited because I already knew who he was as a person, as a coach, and I was very excited to play for him. So that relationship just picked up where it left off. And um, I, I'm a worker, man. So I, I just, I took all the hard coaching that he gave me. I was making sure I was up me with him in his office every day. Um, 
whenever we didn't have practice just to make sure I was putting myself in a position to continue to get better and continue to grow. And it was um it was pretty tough at first, my first spring, just because being in the trenches, the biggest difference is strength level. So once I got that first off season in the gym, that really um, improved my performance in fall camp and led me to get some playing time my freshman year. How'd you lean on JC those first few days here? I, I leaned on him by pretty much just – walking around everything that he did I did you know JC is a great mentor uh, that, that's a big brother of mine we so we actually got to IM JC was at IMG I think two months before I was so we were at IMG that whole time together uh we built that relationship and I I consider JC a brother now so I'm very excited for him and him being drafted early in the first round this Thursday yeah it is draft time so if an NFL GM or a coach were to call you up and be like okay why should we make JC Latham part of our organization what would you say and JC is one of the hardest workers I know and JC is going to do everything in his power to be the greatest and he won't he he won't accept average from anybody and especially not himself he's going to do what he has to do with his body his mind mentally everything in his power to go out and be the greatest and he's going to push people around him and jc has a white belt mentality so jc being older than me i was able to teach him some things and he was able to teach me even more so jc just having that white belt mentality just being willing to learn um why why wouldn't you pick him first <laughs> <laughs> we certainly are wishing the best for jc latham uh for you as a freshman how do you feel like you earned some playing time i earned some playing time just because i i, I feel like I, I had an undeniable fall camp like I just performed at the level of the the older guys above me and I felt like I I forced the coach's hands like like you have you have to play me like I'm I'm doing everything I was supposed to be doing on and off the field to earn that playing time and I um I did that and then the coaches trusted me in a couple of crucial moments in some big games and just knowing that they had that confidence in me it helped me build more confidence within myself and then just having that playing time my freshman year going into my sophomore year I, I was out there and I felt like a vet you know what were the moments that really stand out to you about your freshman year? I imagine, you know, week one, you're in Bryant Denny Stadium. Everything's so new. Week mm -hmm. two, you're on the road at Texas. Maybe the hottest game Alabama's played in the same <laughs> era. Oh, yeah. So that was when I got my first snap of college football in <laughs> Texas. I think, a, no, it was a Mill Echior. His helmet came off, so I had to run in and go in for a play. And I don't even think Coach Wolf called me in the game. I just went in. <laughs> I, I just went in. So I just went in. I had that one play, and then I, I – that was that first shot of adrenaline. I was just like, oh, my gosh. Like, I, I love this, and I want to feel this all the time. So that next week we played um, university – U we played ULM. Mm -hmm. And going into that game, people around the building were saying, great job, keep it up. So I felt like I felt like there was a change coming, like something big was going to happen for me this week. So we get, I knew I was going to play a lot that game because ULM is – no, I don't ever want to disrespect one of my opponents, but um, that's a game that we expect to be up early in, and they told the younger guys to be ready to play. So um, I think we get to the third drive in the game, and Coach Wolf looks at me. He said, are you ready to go? I said, of course I'm ready to go. And then he put me in the game, and it, it never stopped from there. And I found my way into the rotation and started playing a lot more, and, and I felt like I just I earned that. Like I forced the coach's hand, and just it, there's no substitute for experience. And I really like to thank Emil Ekiur, Javion Cohen, Tyler Steen, Seth, JC, Darian, all those guys that really nurtured me into being ready for that role and being ready for that position. And especially Javion and Emil, just because they they never felt threatened by me. They always wanted to see me succeed. Like those, those are two of my big brothers for life just because they took care of me. Like, let's be real about it. Like, I was taking away some of their play time. I was taking away some of their playing time. And, for them to support me and not have any ill will towards me, that, that meant the world to me. Like, I, I never felt any type of bad blood between us, and, and we're still close friends to this day. I'm close friends with both of those guys to this day. Mentioned the Texas game when you're on the road as a freshman. Obviously, anytime Alabama goes anywhere, it's that school's biggest home game of the season. Yeah. Uh, and we really saw that your freshman year, 2022, uh, at Tennessee, at LSU, two really loud environments. I know games Alabama ultimately didn't win, but how'd you adjust to dealing with all the crowd noise that happens? Because again, it's when the opponent or when the home team is on defense, that's when it's at its loudest, when Alabama has the football. So how did you adjust to the noise, specifically with those two games, Tennessee and LSU? I'm really relying on our hand signals. So back then we got our plays through signals. So um, whatever the play was, just being really cognizant of that, making sure I really knew the signals beforehand. And then uh, you just come up with stuff on the fly. So if me and Seth had a double team, he would go like this. It, it was that loud. And then even watching film back on the Tennessee game, that's the loudest environment that I've 
ever been in and I, <laughs> i've been to a travis scott concert and i think <laughs> i think i think neyland stadium was a little bit louder than that so um just being in that environment um I had a great time. That's some of the most fun I've ever had playing football. Like that's that's why I came to Alabama. Not obviously not to lose, but just to play in those big games and those big environments like that. Um, it, that that's what you come to Alabama for. Absolutely. And that game was a shootout. Hendon Hooker doing his thing for Tennessee. But Bryce Young, a week removed from injury, didn't get to play at all. The Texas A and M game injured against Arkansas. Still not at a hundred percent. But he played one of the best games of his career. I felt like in that game. Yeah, people really don't bring that game up a lot. And Bryce. Bryce is amazing for that because not able, not being able to have a lot of reps throughout the week in practice just because he was resting his shoulder and to come out and throw for like, what, 500 yards yeah. and I think four touchdowns is is nothing sort of amazing. So just having that kind of guy, that selfless leader that's going to go out and put his body on the line for the team, that, that just taught me what a leader is supposed to do for his, for his pack. Yeah, what would you like about his leadership and obviously Will Anderson Jr. that year as well? So Bryce and Will were like kind of yin and yang. Will was the loud, rah-rah guy, and Bryce is the kind of guy that will pull you aside and, and talk to you if need be. So just having those two leaders, um, that they really taught me how to lead, and I try to embody what both of them did as leaders. So sometimes I will get loud and be the rah-rah guy, but there are times where I'll um, be a little quieter and if there's a guy that I need to talk to encourage reach out to um, challenge I can do that quietly at, just like Bryce did and um, I'm very appreciative to both of those guys for really teaching me how to lead at the college level even though you're just a sophomore last year I think you go to anybody that followed Crimson Tide football closely fans of the program they'd say you were one of the leaders of this football team this past year uh, when did you feel that responsibility to speak up maybe a little bit more with some of your teammates uh, probably as soon as Bryson Will left because I knew there was um, there was going to be a hole left by them just because of the way that that cared for this team and um, just knowing that I was going to have to step into that leadership role and I was comfortable doing so. Um, it, it was it was really easy for me to do just because I love all these guys on the team and I want to see everybody be great and we're, um, we're only as good as our weakest link. So just lifting everybody up from from the walk-ons to the starters and that's something I've always been willing to do I've always I feel like I've always been a leader in any any program that I've been a part of so yeah that was that was a much welcome challenge I, I had a I had a lot of fun with this team last year and I feel like the difference between that 2022 team and this past year's team is that everybody shared the burden of leadership carried the load of leadership and that made it easier so it didn't feel like it was just two guys carrying the whole team leadership wise and and it wasn't it wasn't that the 2022 year and I imagine that's why Coach Saban has said things like this 2023 team is one of the most proud teams that he's ever coached. He's proudest of that team because you took steps from week one to week 12. Obviously, in the SEC championship game against Georgia, you got so much better as the year along. How did it feel for you guys in that locker room trying to make improvement week to week? It felt great because we always knew the potential that we had, like just going at it in practice. Like we would always have those talks in the locker room. We're like, man, if we could really put a game together, we're, we're going to be dangerous in. The more games that we did play together, the more dangerous we became. And this is something that people don't realize. We had a whole – I think we only had maybe two returning starters to the offense from the year before. So, that of course, there's going to be some bumps in the road. And I, I don't know how many returning starters we had on defense, but two completely different coordinators, two completely different schemes just going in there. Of course, there's going to be some growing pains. But um, the more we grew together, the better we became. So I knew it was going to be rough at first, but I just know we had to stay persistent and, and consistent to um, listening to what the coaches tell us to do, them trusting us, us trusting them, and going out there and performing to the best of our ability. How important was that Ole Miss game when Jalen Milrow really took ownership of the quarterback spot? It was super important because Jalen, he, he, he's always been a leader, even even that 22 year when Bryce was starting. Like he – Jalen has a way about him. Like you, you can you know when a quarterback walks into a room, they have this aura, they have this certain swag about them. Whether you're loud or quiet, everybody has that certain swag. Every quarterback has that certain swag to him, and Jalen has always had that. So for him to really take over, that's when everybody on the team know like, okay, as often like, okay, if we block for this guy, he's gonna get this done. And the defense like, okay, if we get the ball back in his hands, they're gonna score a lot. So just having that trust between. Everybody, he um, he really earned everybody's trust that game, and he he had it beforehand, but it, he put the country on notice. Like he he was like, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> that was so good to see. And then again, his confidence grew. He kept playing well as the season goes along. Uh, you get to Auburn, you get to the Iron Bowl, your first Iron Bowl on the road at Auburn. How tough was it, first of all, to play in that environment? 
it was really it, that game was weird, you know, because we started off so fast and it didn't feel as close. It didn't, the game didn't feel as close as it was until probably around the fourth quarter because I felt like we always. I never felt like we were in horrible shape because we were always like one or two plays away from getting the job done as far as going down and scoring. And whenever we needed to, we did. So um, I didn't realize how close the game was until I looked up at the scoreboard. And I was like, oh, shoot, we got to <laughs> score pretty soon. <laughs> but just that that crowd was rocking. Um, that's that's another reason why you come to Alabama, just to, to beat Auburn <laughs> at Auburn, you know, so. Yeah, uh, the muff punt, uh, Alabama's able to get the football back. Kind of walk me through that final drive and how Jalen led you guys down the field and obviously had some adversity, backed up with fourth and 31. Uh, what was your role on that play? I just making sure everybody had faith. You know, you just have to believe it. If you don't believe what you're doing, it's not going to happen. If you don't really truly have faith in what you're doing, it's you, you're not going to get it done. So just I, I was just re- reiterating to everyone, just have faith in and trust in the process. Like we, we haven't come this far just to come this far. So just trust in the game plan, trust in the, trust in the play call, and then just go out and perform. And your offensive line did its job on that play. Jalen had a lot of time to really rear back and throw that pass to Isaiah. Definitely. Um, I don't ever want to criticize the coach, but them only bringing two was <laughs> very puzzling. Did that surprise you when you got to the line? I mean, how did you kind of go through your pre-snap routine only seeing two? It was very surprising, but I thought, I was like, because our coach had prepared us for this game they had, they actually got they got home on twice. They either got home or um, had a pressure. I, I, it might have been three times, but um, yeah, that was that was their go to game, and we had prepared for that. But it was something that they were still getting home on. So I was expecting that to only see two people. I was like, okay, like let me just make sure Caden's all right. Let me make sure Seth's all right, and just help those two guys. But um, it was pretty easy for me, and I had a front row seat to see one of the <laughs> best Iron Bowl players of all time. Yeah, so you were getting to help those guys out. So did you were you able to see the pass get thrown? Were you able to see a clear view of Isaiah making the catch in the corner? It wasn't clear. It, was, it I just I just saw the ball go over my head, and I just ran down to cover the ball because you never know what can happen. And I seen, I, I believe it was Malik Benson. He threw his hands up like we scored. I was like, did we score? <laughs> <laughs> and and every the crowd just it went crazy. The crowd. The, Actually, the crowd went silent. It right. was, it was yeah. quiet. Our st- our fan <laughs> section went crazy, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I, I think we just scored." But yeah, that was I, I'm, I'll never forget that play. So that's such an emotional high again. It's the Iron Bowl. It's a huge rivalry. Everyone feels so good about how that game ended. But now you only have a few days to get ready for it. The huge opportunity, the SEC championship against Georgia, uh, and Alabama played a great football game that night against a team that hadn't lost in two years. What did you guys do in the week leading up to kind of move past the Auburn game, which again, 24 hour rule, we know all those things, but that had to be a difficult adjustment to kind of snap and clear, get ready for Georgia. But you guys did very well. Yeah, I don't think. It was difficult snapping and getting ready on Georgia, and I feel like that's why we performed like we did against Auburn. I feel like some people on the team were looking too far ahead to playing Georgia, and we kind of lost focus on the task at hand, and that taught us a great lesson. So, um, yeah, we were <laughs> a little bit too worried on Georgia, but it ended up paying off and us having a great game against them and just um, imposing our will on them in the run game. You're really proud of your play that night because of the run game, and also you're going up against some of the best in the SEC with how good Georgia's been on the defensive line. Definitely. Georgia has one of the best defensive lines in the country, so to go out and have a great game and rush for how many ever, how many yards we did rush for, I think it was a good amount, and pretty much run the ball out. like that. That's always uh, – you can always hang your hat on that as an offensive lineman when you can run the ball out at the end of the game. Like They're pretty much putting the ball in, in the offensive line's hands and saying, like, hey, lead us to victory. And we saw that great celebration in Atlanta. Were you confident once that game was over and that night and then before the selection show, Alabama would get into the college football playoff? Uh, of course. And they had no chance but to put it – had no choice but to put us in just because uh, we, we beat the number one team. We beat the reigning champ. So, why, like, who else would get in over us? And just the constant progression that we were on, just getting better week by week, I felt like it was a no-brainer. I, I don't know why it was such a conversation through the college football world like you can't you can't have that conversation without being biased like there was there was some bias if you like if you say that we shouldn't have been in there like you probably went to the school that should have been in there you think should have been in there or something of that sort but I feel like we definitely earned the right to be there you certainly did as Alabama got to go to the Rose Bowl to take on Michigan your old teammate JJ McCarthy (laughs) the quarterback of the Wolverines uh just what stands out to you from that ball game especially with the way it ended that was a um I think it was a great game by both teams. They they just made more plays than we did, and that's what it comes down to. They executed 
one or two more plays than we did. And when you play a team like that, that has been together for so long and has so much chemistry, um, you you can't leave room for mistakes. And they definitely took advantage of our mistakes. Um, so, yeah, and then when you look at that defense, that was a great defense. I feel like that's one of the best defenses I've played since I've been in college. Everybody on that defense that was a starter was a, either a junior or, or older. So just having that continuity throughout the team and having that um, – having having those bonds throughout the defense that made them very strong and just seeing that and um just seeing that and really wanting to implement that here and just said show guys that like hey if you stick it out if you stay here like we we have a chance to be great and we can use them in, as an example you can always learn um i used to come to the nick saban football camps when i was younger and coach saban always told us he actually told the same stories every single year it was pretty funny <laughs> but he told us um never waste a failure so just mm -hmm. looking back at that game and seeing what they did but we didn't do and just making sure that drives us and you we use that as motivation for this coming season was that when coach Saban met with you guys after the game and what was his message did you ever have a feeling that that could be the last game he coaches uh not before he spoke to us i felt like we were Felt like he was giving us a speech to get ready for this um, upcoming off season, get ready to get back at it, and really make another run at this national championship because we we were right there. We were a few plays away from being where we wanted to be, and that was just a that was just the story of our season, just not executing when we needed to the most and letting too many mistakes catch up to us, and they finally caught up to us versus Michigan. So I thought Coach Sable was going to come and talk to us about that, but um, he decided to retire and. Uh, when you have a coach with such a le with a legacy as, as big as his, you um, you can only clap for him and give him his flowers just because you you know he didn't come to the decision easily. Like it's a pretty tough decision for him. But um, since I've, I've seen him since he's retired, and he's very happy. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen him happier. So um, he definitely earned it. <laughs> Less stress, right? And more that, golf, yeah. <laughs> old, a whole lot. <laughs> That's certainly good. Uh, take us through that time, too, uh, that you get the news on that Wednesday. But then by Friday afternoon, we know that Kalen DeBoer is going to be the new head coach of the Crimson mm -hmm. Tide. He gets to Tuscaloosa that night. Uh, what was his message uh, when you got to meet with Coach DeBoer the first time? He was big on family and big on relationships. And that really – made me feel very comfortable with him being our head coach just because that's that was the difference between 2022 and 2023. We did a lot more team activities. I feel like there was a lot more togetherness with that team. And I was I was really focusing on that, like focus on a relationship, becoming more of a family. And hearing coach hearing those be the first words out of Coach DeBoer's mouth, that made me feel really comfortable with um who they brought in as a head coach. Did you like the atmosphere at spring practice? I mean everyone's talking about the music. Oh yeah, it was a little different. We we had music at um at, at IMG, so <laughs> having that back, it was a little different. It was a little fun. And we all just talk about like, oh my gosh, what would Coach Saban think? Because <laughs> because it's so different, but just us having music at practice is just a testament to who Coach DeBoer is and my message to Coach Bowen when he first got here was like, don't try to be Coach Saban, just be you because you're here for a reason. Uh, Athletic Director Greg Byrne chose you for a reason. So just just be you and be the person that you've been to this point to get you where you are now. What do you like about your new offensive line coach, Coach Cap? Coach Cap, he's um he's he's a hard nosed coach. You know, he's gonna coach you hard no matter who you are. Um, he's gonna work with us. So it's not like he's talking at us like, hey, this is what we're gonna do. If you have something that's different, he's gonna let you try it. And if it doesn't work, you're gonna do what he wants you to do. But he's um he's all about working with us. I feel like it's more of a partnership than um a superior and an inferior. We're having this interview uh, at Brian Denny Stadium at the Advantage Center in their podcast studio. Uh, it's all part of the name, image, and likeness initiatives that Alabama is trying to promote. And for you, you've been pretty active with name, image, and likeness. Just what have you liked uh, getting involved? And I know you've done a lot of interviews like this before. Uh, how much have you enjoyed kind of getting to grow your personal brand along with representing Alabama? I really enjoy um, name, image, and likeness just because of I'm, I'm allowing people to get to know me as a person. Like, of course, like they see this big, scary guy on the football field, but I, I feel like I'm a pretty nice guy. I think people say I'm a nice guy and just um, getting people, people being able to get to know my personality and that makes people more invested to who I am and more invested to my brand. So once I do get to the next level, that fan base and that community um, is more drawn to me than before. And in fact, with NIL, I'm even able to, have a bigger name throughout the community so I'm having a bigger effect on the people within the community so just being able to give back like I'm a part of the big brother big sister program so I have a I have a little brother who's at one of the local Tuscaloosa elementary schools so I go see him once a week and I used to see him every week during the season and he would, we would just talk about the game we always have a great time and I still see him um to this day so 
just being able to have a positive effect on the community and people getting able to know me personally, I feel like that's the best part of an idea. Have you liked doing interviews like this? I mean, and you've been on the Paul Feinbaum show before oh, yeah. too. He's kind of praised <laughs> you and is like, hey, you've got another career in media down the road if you want it. <laughs> Definitely. I, I really do enjoy doing interviews like this and um, doing interviews like this has really opened up my eyes to a career in media possibly in the future. And um, I, I definitely wouldn't be opposed to that. And I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Um, I, I really enjoy the game of football. And I, I don't know exactly what I want to do when I'm done playing. But I always want to be around the game of football, whether I coach, whether I'm part of media, um, operations, something. I, the game has done so much for me. I just want to give back to the game. I'll agree with Paul. I think you got a bright future if you want to do it. Uh, <laughs> Tyler, we've had a blast uh, catching up here Likewise. on Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR. Just thank you for your time. Best of luck this summer. Roll Tide. Thank you. Appreciate you. Roll Tide.